Today we're going to talk about Here I Am, Lord. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 is a familiar text featured in lectionaries for Trinity Sunday, this Sunday, apparently due to the three-time cry of holy shouted by the seraphim flying about Yahweh in the temple. Or perhaps it's included because of Isaiah's call and his willingness to answer that call. Here I am, send me. Nor is it any secret that much of the worship you and I experience derives its shape from Isaiah 6. Begins with a hymn of praise, moves to an admission of sin, is followed by forgiveness of that sin, includes a call to service, and ends with a positive response. That's the basic shell of what we do in worship, and it's an old pattern indeed. It happened in the year that King Uzziah died. The significance these words carry may easily be lost on us who have no kings, who are removed in time and history from the ancient world, who live in a democratic and fluid culture. Yet they have meaning for us too. The death of a king, particularly this king, was a tumultuous event in the ancient world. Not long before his death, King Uzziah had been struck with leprosy by God because of his pride and disobedience. He had tried to burn an offering on the altar in the temple, despite the attempted intervention of 80, count them, 80, duly consecrated priests. King Uzziah was forced to live in quarantine and rule by proxy for the last rest of his life. Add these circumstances to the general sense of dislocation and instability that came with the death of a king, a king who had ruled more than 50 years and brought prosperity to Israel. Isaiah's words begin to carry some weight, even for us so far removed. We might get a sense of the event if we compare it to the assassination of JFK in, in the USA or the impact of 9-11, that terrible day when the planes flew into the World Trade Center. We remember the fear and grief and uncertainty that gripped our nation. If we can sense the emotional distress connected with these events, we can begin to appreciate the time in which Isaiah saw his vision. It may be that some of us feel dislocation and disturbance in our own era as we consider global issues which confront us, pandemic, terrorism, economic crisis, poverty, climate issues, and again, war in the Holy Land. It's in the midst of human loss and suffering, in the midst of separation and disconnection that Isaiah sees a vision of the ever living praise of God, which continues to resound from the mouths of the seraphim. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Do you recognize these words? The Sanctus? We sing them in hymns and speak them in communion liturgy. These powerful words of praise join us not only with the song of the seraphim, but also with the saints and martyrs of every time and place. These words derived from scripture are the oldest known aspect of modern liturgy in the church, dating back to the first century. And they were important part of the Eucharistic worship by the sixth century. When we say these words, holy, 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 we're transported into the throne room of God's presence. The divisions created by time and space crumble away. False divisions of our human brokenness are transcended. These words act as symbol of our unity as God's people with all those divine and earthly beings who continue to praise God. They're not only words of praise, but words of hope. Hope in the unity that we long for. Hope that in the face of whatever we are experiencing, God is still being worshiped and adored. It was not worship as usual for the nascent prophet. I saw the Lord, he said, not Yahweh, but Adonai, the Lord, sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, the divine robes filling the temple. 
it's quite unusual for any person to be described as actually having seen the Lord, but it says it here. Though the name Yahweh is not used, perhaps to mitigate this astonishing claim of actually seeing the divine one. But that is far from all the prophet sees. Seraphs were attending this Lord from above. Each had six wings, with two they hid their faces, with two they hid their feet, and with two they flew. These seraphs are heirs of a long Middle Eastern tradition of great flaming monsters who lived up there, who were poised to come in wrath and destruction. But not here. Here they serve one Lord flying around and above God on missions of service and praise. The six winged creatures cleverly use their wings not only to fly, but also to hide both their face and their feet. The former perhaps to cover their scary countenances and the latter to hide their sex. Feet is more than once used as a euphemism for genitals in the Hebrew. And as they flew, they cried to each other, Holy, 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 Yahweh of the armies, all the earth is full of God's glory. The monsters have become Yahweh's chief servants and press agents, announcing eternally God's greatness and power. The foundations of the thresholds shook at the sound of those shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. The scene is worthy of Cecil B. DeMille. The vast presence of God robed and filling the temple, the six winged creatures flying and shouting, the entire temple rocking with the sound, while smoke adds an eerie haze to the frame of the picture. The wide lens of the camera has been focused on the vast panorama above, filled with flying beasts, the Lord and heavenly smoke. But now abruptly, the camera descends to focus on Isaiah who now cries out in horror, woe is me, surely I'm doomed because I'm a man of sinful lips and live among a people of sinful lips. And my own eyes have seen the King, the Yahweh of the armies. In response to the gift of Yahweh's awesome presence, Isaiah can only express his complete unworthiness and his conviction that the people of Israel, including those nearby worshipers, are pathetically inadequate in the face of their God. A genuine experience of God leads Isaiah not first to praise and gratitude, but to fear and horror. This overwhelming sense of astonishment and awe may be the very essence of what many of us lack in our 21st century worship and praise. Being prophetic is no trivial matter if Isaiah's experience is any guide for us. Isaiah 6 describes an extraordinary vision of a divine court, but the vision takes place not in heaven, but on earth, in the very temple where heaven and earth meet and where political sovereignty and religious authority intersect. As the seer looks on, the court is in session and the Lord of hosts sits aloft on his throne, clothed in a robe that fills the whole temple, a temple that reverberates with the sound of the seraphs. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That the divine judge fills both temple and the earth and gives us a glimpse of universality of the Lord's, uh, the Lord's kingship, it makes us pause. It makes us catch our breaths. The legal standing of God extends to not just a small tribal corner in a closed society, but to the whole world where true justice is valued. Tyrants come under judgment, not because they violate the rights and impede the freedom of their own citizens. They are judged because they violate a universal code of conduct whose sole guarantor is none other than the ancient one, the Lord of hosts. The judge does not speak, not yet anyway. Now, do we see the characteristics which we normally associate with him? There's no need. The sweeping robe and the seraphic voices accompanied by the quaking and the smoke is quite enough to convince us. 
The mere presence of God establishes the universality of rights and justice. There's no need for an independent warrant. There can be none. The would-be prophet cowers before the throne and whimpers, woe is me, I'm lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people lips. No posturing, no preachiness, no self-righteousness, only a spontaneous, reflexive, even involuntary confession of guilt. There's none of the modern legal trappings of proof and evidence. In the presence of the author and originator of true justice, the only proper response can be an admission of guilt. Not just one, one's own guilt, but the collective guilt of the whole people. God immediately recognizes the shock of the guilty man before him. So his next act is not one of comfort or consolation. It's nothing less than a burning ember on the mouth. The seraph, using a pair of tongs, grabs a live coal from the altar fire and touches Isaiah's lips with it. He then announces, look, this has touched your lips. Your sin has departed and your guilt is covered. It's understood that the will of God is to forgive Isaiah's sin in order to prepare him to serve God. Now Isaiah is ready to hear the call of God. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Choose me, choose me. He's eager. These lines have become almost cliche for us. Here I am, Lord, is a hymn that's become among the most popular in our time. And we know that popular phrases have a way of losing their power and credibility. I'm not trying to dismiss the work of Dan Schutte, who wrote this hymn, number 593 in the United Methodist Hymnal. He articulated an understandable response to the passage because the reading usually stops at verse eight. This hymn captures much of the hope and joy one might feel in answering the call of God on one's life. Indeed, it has become a standard for ordination and commissioning services. But Isaiah 6, 8 is not the end of this passage about the call of the prophet. The call ends in verse 13, and that's an important observation. So listen again to verse eight. I heard the voice of my Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Wait, he said, us. Maybe that plural is in, in the text and it's what ignites our Trinitarian speculation. And then I said, here I am, send me. That seems clear enough. God calls and the prophet willingly responds, but isn't something missing? Why am I being called? Where am I supposed to go? And for what reason? Answers to those questions do not appear until verse 9 and following. And to those answers, well, they're a different kettle of fish altogether. God said, go and say to this people, listen intently, but do not perceive. Look very carefully, but do not understand. Make this people's mind dull, clog up their ears, cloud over their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and perceive with their minds, then turn and are healed. I beg your pardon. The content of Isaiah's call is that he preach in such a way that his hearers will not be able to comprehend what their God has in mind for them. Now, my own sermons might have that effect on my listeners, but lack of understanding was not my intention. I did not imagine that the God who called me to ministry intended my sermons to lead people away from the truth. But that's exactly what it sounds like God's call to Isaiah demands he should do. Astonishing. So quite rightly, and perhaps now, with a decided reluctance in his voice, Isaiah replies to his call, not here I am, but how long, Lord? Just how long do you want me to confuse and confound and turn aside the people you've called me to attend? And here is the chilling answer. Until cities are blasted without inhabitant, houses without people, and land is completely shattered, 
until Yahweh sends everyone away and emptiness in the land is enormous. Even if only a tenth part remain, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump still stands after it's cut down. Isaiah is called by his God to make the people of Israel unaware of the terrible spot they're in. Due to Isaiah's ministry of the word, Israel will be decimated, annihilated, sent off to exile. Because of him, they will not be able to turn and be healed. The results of his work are guaranteed to be disastrous. How long, Lord? How long indeed? But a tiny flicker of hope ends this appalling ministerial call. Isaiah 6, 13 ends with these words, a holy seed is its stump. After the felling of the tree of Israel, after the burning of the stump, all that will remain is the seed. And that seed is somehow holy, somehow sacred, somehow able to start things anew. It's the smallest of hopes, but it is a hope nonetheless. And on that slim hope rests the ministry of Isaiah. And on that slim hope rest our ministries as well. Here I am, send me. Often it's the first response to those who have a sense of call from God. But once we see what God has in store for us, we may sound more like Moses in his call. Please, not me, he said. Those words might fly from our lips. Yahweh's appearance in the burning bush elicits from Moses, not the Isaiah, send me, but a choose somebody, anybody else, he said. It could be said, I suppose, that we who are called need both these responses to encompass our ministries. Just what this call from God is fully like. Sometimes in the triumphal, here I am, and at other times, the defeated, send someone else, please. The call is mysterious, both dark and light, both joyful and burdensome. What else ought we to expect when in this world, not some eternally pleasant and peaceful place, we are called? The paradox of our Christian existence is that while we were born from above, while signs of the kingdom do break in, while we do with one voice praise God with the sanctus, we live in tension with those who still have unclean lips. We harm one another. In pride, we compete for power and position. We neglect the cry of our brothers and sisters in need. We carry a message of love and hope, yet struggle to be all that we were called to be, even to those we love most dearly. We are the world for whom Christ died. We have been saved. We have been made whole. We are constantly being renewed by his love. We continue to enter his presence, to have burning coals touch our lips. And like Isaiah, we continue to be called. We can say, here I am, send me. Even when the message we carry is a difficult one to understand, to live by to proclaim to a world who does not want to hear it. We're sent by God in mission because we have encountered God, because we have been brought face to face with God's holiness and our brokenness, and because we have been made whole by God's grace. In response to this worshipful moment, we lay our lives before God. Isaiah hears the Lord say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he responds, here I am, send me. At its root, Isaiah's cry of here I am is a response to God's presence and grace. Isaiah is not volunteering because he thinks he has skills God can use or has time on his hands. Isaiah is laying down his life before the God who encountered him and made him whole. So what are we to make of this? I imagine that if Isaiah had been more keenly aware of what God wanted from him, he might have skipped worship that day. He surely would have wanted to take back those faithful words about asking to be sent. Perhaps 613 may be a clue for the meaning of this terrible demand. Isaiah's call is not for sweet preaching of comfort and joy, 
but for harsh demands for our people lost and far from the ways of their God, despite what they think. Isaiah's only hope, and our only hope too, is from the tiny smoldering stump of a blasted tree that may become the holy seed of our future with God. There are times for comfort, but Isaiah's time was not one of those. Rather, God has called him to witness to the struggle to understand and to join the community that seeks to live out the rule of God in this world. In 740 BCE, Israel was far from such a rule. In 2021, it seems equally fair to say that we are far from it too. Our call from God this Trinity Sunday may also be a difficult one. Hence, if we do choose to sing that hymn saying, here I am, Lord, we had better be clear about just where and for what the Lord may be sending us. Thanks be to God who knows us and calls us. Amen. Let's pray. Holy, holy, holy God, the earth is full of the glory of your love. May we, your children, born of your spirit, so bear witness to your son, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, that all the world may believe and have eternal life through the one who saves, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.